Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Top 5 ICS Assets and How to Protect Them. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Dean Parsons, SANS Certified Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for Dean, please, keep them, uh, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Dean. All right, thank you very much, Carol. Really appreciate that. Thanks so much for everybody for joining today on this Friday afternoon. Uh, super appreciate your time. So we're gonna jump right in. We have a lot of content to cover. And of course, this is specifically for the industrial control area. Uh, before we get started, just a quick background on myself to give you some, uh, I guess, history here. Uh, as Carol mentioned, my name is Dean Parsons. I've been in the industry in cybersecurity for about 20 years. First part of my career spent really on the IT area, a lot of technical focus, building teams, also policy focus in IT and telecommunications. And from there, uh, nine, 10 years into that part of my career, I shifted over specifically to focus on industrial control systems. So for the last nine, 10 years, I've been focused on the electric power sector, generation, transmission, distribution of electric power, also really recently focused in the oil and gas areas, but assessments as well across a number of different ICS kind of sectors as well. So today's topic is really gonna be focused on the five top critical ICS assets. And we're gonna find out where those assets basically are found in the industrial control network. We're gonna suggest how to protect some of those assets as well. And of course, as Carl mentioned, we do have a Q&A section at the end. So bring on those questions today, put those into the chat window and we'll address those at the end of the conversation for today. Now, of course, we are talking about industrial control systems. So if you're interested or have responsibility in one of these sectors on the screen right now, whether it's chemical manufacturing, whether it's critical manufacturing of, of assets such as cars, for example, or the transportation, energy, nuclear reactors, as an example, wastewater management, these are the things we're gonna cover today. Everything in today's presentation is applicable to these sectors. Now, of course, before we jump into the good content, there's this wall of text I wanna quickly brief over just uh, in a few moments, just to kind of ground us to what we're talking about today and why we're talking about these top five, where these top five assets came from. Now, of course, in the industrial sector, we're really talking about engineering assets. Of course, there are some IT, traditional IT systems used for uh, OT purposes, but of course we have physical systems, digital systems in the engineering world as well. And in an ICS, they're typically across several different geographically dispersed areas. So what we're gonna talk about today are these ICS assets that we know from ICS threat intelligence are targeted from observed attacks in the industrial control sector across many sectors in the industrial space. Now, of course, we do know with any Thing that will have security around it, it's going to be critical to get security event logs. This goes well beyond things like Windows event logs, for example. We will talk about things like getting event logs from field devices, such as controllers and whatnot as well. There's ways to do that. So we're going to talk really about getting event logs, but also talking about getting network logs at the plant floor level, the control network traffic and usually monitoring that with trained ICS defenders. That's the objective. Now, of course, again, these top five assets we're gonna talk about today, I highly recommend you uh, integrate into your incident response tabletop exercises for your industrial control part of your organization specifically. Now, as we talk about these five uh, assets in the ICS environment, there are other assets we'll brief on as well. So the idea here is that there are passive uh, engineering devices, there's physical devices and safety devices, digital devices such as protection control relays in the electric sector, pressure valves and water distribution systems, safety controllers in the oil and gas pipelines, etc. So all of these things you might have in addition to the ones we're going to talk about in the ICS environment for your specific ICS. And all of that to say that your ICS may have more than these top five critical uh, assets in your environment. 
So as we see here, there are a number of examples of ICS assets. So anything from a smart meter could be critical to your industrial control environment. Remote access, for example, in the infrastructure to support that for vendor relationships, but also vendor access for troubleshooting could also be very critical, especially when we're talking about remote areas across geographically dispersed regions, as an example. And there's several other examples of critical devices, such as a pump, for example, which is critical in water and wastewater management, project files, as an example, as well, serial devices, solenoids, all of these other devices, which are not traditionally seen in IT environments are absolutely important. But again, we're gonna focus on the top five critical. Okay, so we'll talk about those top five, the purpose of each of them and how it's applicable to the industrial control environment and how we know that the adversary is gravitating towards these devices to cause harm and disruption and change the industrial control environments as we've seen in recent attacks, as recent as of this year, but also going back several years as well. Again, tracking the adversary tactics and techniques in the industrial control space. So, these assets are based on criticality to the engineering and safety processes based on ICS threat intelligence and defense information and generally applicable to most all industrial control system sectors. So without further ado, let's look at the top four first because the, the fifth one may surprise you. So the top five critical assets are those PLCs, the programmable logic controllers. And we'll dive deep into each one of these and the purpose in just a few moments. But let's just list them out here. And you will see these icons representing each of the five critical assets as we go through the presentation today. So we have the PLC, which is a programmable logic controller. We have data historians as well. So that's an industrial control system, database system and server. We have engineering workstations. We also have the human machine interface. Now these are specific industrial control system assets. Now, the last one definitely deserves a star because it is extremely important, but it is not an actual industrial control system asset. And then of course that is the IT email system where we've really seen it being abused as a vector or way in to compromise an organization and a foothold to potentially pivot to the industrial control system space. So that one definitely gets a star, and we will talk about that one later on as well, specifically how to protect it, which anybody on the call today from IT will be absolutely on board with. But again, it's critical, and we'll see how this kind of shapes the threat landscape as we go through the details for each one of these assets as we go. Now, if we're talking about on the plant floor, and don't worry, the Purdue model is coming up shortly, we'll align all of this to the Purdue model. If we talk like really low level in the industrial control environment, we're gonna see those programmable logic controllers. These are not running your typical operating systems. A lot of these devices can run proprietary software. So things like the protection of these devices is not as simple and straightforward as installing something like endpoint protection, which a lot of traditional IT systems utilize today. Don't worry though, there are ways to protect these assets that we will talk about shortly. This programmable logic controller really connects the physical hardware into the real world. It runs logic code, ladder logic, or a project file that reads and changes the state of the engineering process. And what that means is if we're in a wastewater management facility, for example, and an operator says, I need to add a certain chemical to clean the water before the water gets to the local town for human consumption, then the change would be implementing a, a change in the logic or assisting the logic to um, ask hardware to open a valve or open a pump to release or input a certain chemical to clean that water as an example. So as we see here, this programmable logic controller uses a lot of uh, industrial processes on, you know, in, in, inside of it and underneath it. And if we see just on the screen here, we can see a, a wire capture, um, a t-shirt capture of the industrial control system commands going across the wire. Now in this particular case, we see Modbus TCP, which is a specific industrial control system protocol being utilized. Here we actually are seeing those read state and change states in the actual code on the wire. And this is read coils and also write the multiple coils and registries. This is how the controller, the PLC, uh, communicates with other devices, which we'll talk about in a moment, and how the system actually operates. So the PLC is critical, it runs logic code, and it allows us to interface with real world to make changes and reads state of that uh, environment as well. 
to understand if it's appropriate to make a change, when we should make a change, et cetera. So this will come back again, but this is the PLC. Now beyond the programmable logic controller, we're gonna dive, we're actually gonna go right up high in the Purdue model and really talk about the data historian. Now the data historian is a database server first and foremost, but the information stored in there is actually information about the industrial process. So it has information like records and such about the industrial control environment. As you see with this graph here, we actually see a wastewater management facility. And in here we can actually see a couple different things being tracked. One is chlorine. We have also a drain being opened or closed. We have other pumps that are being turned on or turned off. So looking at the information from the data historian database can tell you generally changes or trends over time of the process. Now this is critical for anybody uh, in the organization making decisions about the process. Is the process running efficiently as an example? In the electric sector, do we have the systems running effectively? Can we optimize the system? Also, this data historian is targeted for exfiltration of sensitive ICS information. Now, anytime you see connections to and from this device, you should be aware, be aware of what that connection is used for. We do see the data historian being targeted and used for exfiltration, as we mentioned, but also for a pivot point, a way to get access to deeper components of the industrial control system as well. So that's the data historian, which we'll talk about a little bit further on and uh, talk about how to protect it as well. So, so far we have the PLC and the data historian being two of the top five critical assets thus far. And now we will pivot to the engineering workstation. So this engineering workstation, or otherwise known as the EW, has access to software to program, reprogram, update, and change those PLCs we talked about, and other field devices as well. So as you see on the screen here, the engineering workstation does have software similar to what you're seeing that has the ladder logic code inside of it. Now this code you're seeing here is the logic that runs on the programmable logic controller and the engineering workstation works to program that or upload different code or change the code literally on the plant floor in those PLCs that run the operations at a very low level. So of course, if the engineering workstation is compromised, an adversary has the ability to reprogram potentially the plant floor itself at the very heart of the industrial control environment. Now, have we seen the EW targeted? Absolutely. The engineering workstation has been targeted in many ICS specific attacks with the exact purpose of getting access to the ladder logic or code for the programmable logic controllers to in fact change the process. And in this way, you can use the EW to upload that code and hide from the operators, for example, and change the process. But don't worry, there are ways to detect this as well. And some are very, very simple to implement. Also, some of these changes can be detected automatically with some of the engineering workstation software. So the engineering workstation, critical, critical device used legitimately for changing the process used for malicious purpose with changing the process as well, if an adversary can get access to the engineering workstation, or at least the ladder logic that is usually stored on that workstation as well. Of course, the HMI, this is the human machine interface. This is relied upon on a daily basis to be utilized by operators in the industrial control sector across all or many sectors to, to view, adjust, and control the actual industrial control process. So this human machine interface is that visual interface between the physical process, what's actually happening in the plant floor with robotic arms, with pumps turning off and turning on, sensors sensing the environment to make changes. And of course the operators use this to not only view the process, but make those changes as well. So as you see on screen here, these buttons essentially and readouts can indicate the state of the industrial control process at a very high level, but allows these buttons to con uh, for the operator to control or change the process with a click of a button. Now in this particular case here, this is taken from a recent event earlier in 2021, earlier this year, where we actually seen an adversary gravitate towards that human machine interface and use the machine human machine interface against itself. And in this case, it's from the Oldsmar water attack 
uh, which we actually seen a number of different chemicals change. And this one here, it's specifically the sodium hydroxide. That was the only chemical that was changed. And to do that, the adversary gravitated towards this HMI and actually changed the flow rates and, and rate of that uh, chemical inside the process. So this human machine interface used under normal circumstances is used in a safe manner by an engineer or operator using it to understand what's required for safe operation of the system, using the system and then making changes or adjustments where necessary. So it's normal for changes to occur through the HMI process, but not normal for uh, these, this type of chemical, for example, in this particular case, to, uh, to be increased like it was in this particular attack. So this is the HMI, huge, huge asset, critical for any industrial control process. Now, the thing about the HMI, though, is that there can be more than one of them. Here in this case here, we're seeing an HMI running on a Windows environment, but there are other HMIs as well that has similar or the same type of functionality that's embedded in control systems, um, not on an actual Windows device, a traditional Windows device. So there are ways for um, a defender or an organization to still utilize an HMI if the primary HMI potentially is compromised in some way. So that is the HMI. If we go further, now this of course is the, uh, you know, it gets a star because it's uh, not ICS, but it definitely is critical. This is of course the IT email system. Now this email system, while it should never be on an industrial control system, it is targeted for a lot of adversaries in the IT space, but of course in the IT space as well. It's extremely common even today, unfortunately it still works if we don't have a solid security awareness program, that the adversary can get a foothold in an organization network at the IT level from the email system. We see this being utilized by the adversary to pivot potentially towards the data historian, which that data historian, critical ICS asset, typically does share a trust relationship between IT and the OT or ICS environment. This is critical. So this here, as we know, uh, the data historian could be used as a pivot point. But one point I wanna bring up here though, is that if your IT security folks has knowledge of the industrial control sector as well, that will certainly help out the security for the ICS environment. One thing I do want to mention as well beyond that is the IT Active Directory information. We are seeing uh, the adversaries in the ICS space target credentials, stealing credentials from the IT environment, and then using them or attempting to use them to get across to an AD that could be shared or trusted in the ICS environment and then directly pivoting digitally to the ICS. So we'll talk later about some of the protections. The obvious one is having a separate AD for IT and a separate non-trust relationship for an AD in the OT environment as well. We'll talk more about that, but in general, we have discussed those top five critical assets. We'll talk a little bit about where they are in a moment, but also how to protect them so that is the email system we talked about, the human machine interface, the engineering workstation, of course, the PLCs and the plant floor and the data historian. Now, of course, there are several other assets as well. So there's certainly a few here I wanna kind of bring up just to kind of point out because the um, what we talked about is, is general for a lot of ICS sectors. We're gonna talk a little bit about specific uh, assets that could be critical in your ICS uh, that we haven't fully uh, discovered in today's call. So I'll typically label these as bonus ICS critical assets to consider these are sector specific examples. So if you're in oil and gas, if you're in um, electric environment, for example, or if you're in wind offshore or onshore wind turbine control or anything of that nature, these assets coming up will be more specific to your environments. So for sure, I would add these to your list of critical assets as you go do defense and also asset discovery in your environment to see what you should be protecting and what's targeted. So if we look at the utility sector, specifically in the electric sector, there are digital protection relays. This of course is a digital asset and it protects some of the elements of the, um, the electric generation system and also the, the lines essentially. So it senses the type and, and uh, I guess for lack of better words, the rate and volume and power going across certain transmission lines. So this device we have seen being targeted in the past and of course is critical for the electric generation and transmission distribution uh, area. So these digital protection relays should be absolutely protected. 
And similar to how we protect PLCs is a similar mode where we can protect these digital protection relays as well, which we'll get to in a moment. If you are in the wind turbine, for example, you have controllers in the wind turbine in the nacelle, that's the head of these devices for electric generation. Inside of that nacelle, which you see here in the middle graphic, that nacelle has controllers in there, and that also has generators as well. The devices inside of there is critical for the operation of these onshore or offshore devices, and specifically have the functionality to find the optimal yaw pitch uh, for the generation of electricity in the wind, and also get that uh, generation of electricity to a substation from each of those uh, uh, towers in the farm as well. So again, there are controllers in the head of that device, which is the nacelles, which are very similar to normal PLCs, but you may not think of it because it's essentially um, not as tangible or accessible uh, as, as some other devices in other sectors. If you're in oil and gas, for example, there are oil and gas terminals that uh, could be a marine-based terminal. In this case here, we see an offshore tanker unloading uh, to shore the crude oil through something called a buoy. And this buoy could be something as simple, or sorry, as similar as a monobuoy, which allows the, uh, the, the, the ship to interface with this monobuoy, which has access to an underground piping system to pipe its crude oil to shore. This of course is used in certain geographic areas where large uh, tankers cannot get access directly to shore. So uh, in that mono buoy, which could be the size of your house or, or larger, uh, are, are certain specific digital components, firewalls as an example for the industrial control space controllers as well. So when we talk about HMI, you may think the plant, the operators, but there are other devices out there in the field in remote locations that are critical and potentially targeted as well. So those are some other examples. Now just taking the oil and gas marine terminal example to the next level, there's also yards and areas where this fuel is not transfer, uh, transferred from the actual uh, crude oil from the ship into uh, a refinery, but after the refinement process, there's storage locations where fuel is stored. And of course, we see with distribution of this uh, refined fuel, transport trucks and tankers coming in to uh, uh, load up those transports to again distribute to other parts uh, uh, where it's needed. So in this particular case, we have a couple different assets. The one on the right is an HMI. And the one on the left is also an HMI. Both of these will be utilized for different purposes. The one on the left allows things like physical access, controls physical access to an oil and gas facility or site that allows a certain truck or driver or drivers into the environment. And of course, the one on the right allows that driver with access control to utilize the hoses and the pumps on site to get that critical infrastructure and fuel into those um, transport trucks for distribution as an example. So again, something similar to an HMI or a direct HMI by definition, but you might not think of it because it's not in the control system. These devices as well should have the protections we'll talk about that we'll talk about in a few moments as well. And again, I encourage you as we go along here to put any questions you have into the comment section there, and we're gonna be addressing those in a little while. So this is good. I think we got a few of them already, which is really good. So keep those questions coming, everybody. So as we talked about the five critical assets, um, we're gonna talk about where they're typically located in the industrial control environment. Now, of course, some of this is um, generalized because you might have remote areas which you may not have the same type of representation of this network diagram we'll talk about. Suffice it to say, of course, we will be talking about the Purdue model. So in general, the general structure of an industrial environment typically would look like this from the network perspective. Now, of course, at the bottom, we see sensors and actuators. These are the hardware devices, engineering physical devices that will change something in the real world based on the instructions and commands from the um, devices in the upper level in the control elements section. These are the PLCs that we've talked about. There's also safety instrumented systems there as well. A local HMI, which we've talked about, which is uh, at a lower part of the network which may not be running your typical traditional operating systems. Beyond that though, we have the human machine interfaces in the supervisory control elements and engineering workstations at that level. And of course, further up this Purdue model, we have the DMZ, the militarized zone where we have some applications where your historian could be utilized as well. I'll point out those in a little bit, 
at the very top of the uh, diagram, we have the external network, such as the business network, as an example as well. And if you picture on top of that, a cloud environment for IT services. Now, as we go down through this, and as we plot each of those critical assets we talked about into each level that are on the Purdue model, I do wanna remind everybody that we're talking about engineering assets, but there are some representation of IT traditional systems as well. And here at the upper level of the Purdue model, where the business interfaces with the industrial control environment, specific around that DMZ, but also historian, we have IT common operating systems, traditional protocols here. So things you might see here would be the Active Directory protocols, as an example, and other types of file sharing, et cetera. Now, beyond this, we see the majority of the assets are really focused on the engineering side of things. This is the industrial control system environment where we have operating systems adapted to suit the industrial process. We have embedded operating systems as well, proprietary operating systems, and specific industrial control protocols, so things you would not normally see in an IT environment as well. And just to point out, if you do see industrial control protocols on your IT environment, let's have a conversation specifically about the Purdue model uh, and segmentation as well. So if we're taking a look here as well, at the bottom of the Purdue, we also see engineering hardware assets as well. Now, the ultimate question is, where are these critical assets we've talked about in the Purdue model or in relation to the levels of the Purdue model? Well, let's take a further look. So we've just now pasted those critical assets into the environment in the Purdue model. We actually see the HMI here at the lower level, which is embedded HMI at the controlled element area. We see that PLC or safety instrument system there as well. And we also see the engineering workstation just above that in the supervisory control elements, as well as the HMI there, which can be an operating HMI as well, which can be typically running a traditional operating system such as Windows or Linux, but is not normally treated as a typical Windows or Linux system because things like patching and access is very, very different in the ICS versus in the IT. Now here's where we go up to that pivot point, I'll call it that data historian in the DMZ that data historian that has information collected about the process. How much electricity am I generating? Is it at an efficient rate? Also, if I'm generating things like a vaccine and I'm a pharmaceutical company, information in the data historian could be helpful for the adversary from a monetary perspective or intellectual property perspective as well. So it's gonna be key, which we'll talk about later, to spot things like exfiltration of information from the data historian itself. And at the very top of this diagram, we have that winner there, that star up top, which is the IT email system, which could be used as that vector into the organization. Now, the great thing about this diagram here, and it's gonna be no surprise when we talk about protection, is that we have different zones and different levels or enforcement boundaries throughout all of these important assets as we step down through the physical process. So that will absolutely come into play later when we talk about protections. But I'm very happy to see a couple things in this diagram. We have firewalls protecting the industrial control system from the IT environment. We have a number of different switches as well, which potentially indicates we may have at least some segmentation there as well from a digital perspective. I would like to see more firewalls, but in general, we have a good diagram to kind of start with and pivot off of. All right, keep those questions coming, everyone. Okay, so we're gonna come up on how to protect these devices. So we have potentially a Windows device in there or two. We have engineering devices which do not typically have traditional protocols or operating systems on there. And a couple of other things in there as well, which we'll have to take specific consideration when we talk about protection. So how do we protect these environments and specifically these assets? Well, everything we're gonna talk about for the next five or six slides is really applicable to all ICS environments. And I will point out a couple things that does not require you to have two and three and $400,000 budgets or million dollar budgets. So specifically, I'm gonna talk about number one, which is network segmentation. And you've probably heard of this before because it is that affordable and very effective way to do segmentation and security in your environment not only helpful for security, for containment purposes, all of those things, but really helpful when we talk about engineering troubleshooting and zoning and things like that as well. So number one is absolutely network segmentation, where we have the ICS segmented off from a firewall perspective 
uh, from the IT environment. We have the ICS segmented off from the cloud services, but also internet environment as well. And yes, of course, there are situations where we have, um, hopefully have secure remote access to the industrial control process. And this is typically used for things like remote operations in emergency situations or access to some parts of the industrial environment for vendor access for troubleshooting and things of that nature as well. Of course, that segmentation should be controlled with multi-factor authentication and of course monitored for sure. So in general, network segmentation is really the, I'll say the, the, the first stage of protection for these types of assets which is really at the bottom of the sliding scale of cybersecurity, if you've heard of that before, which I can reference later on as well. So network segmentation for sure. The second thing here is network security monitoring, which is in this order for a reason. If you do network segmentation, that affordable segmentation in your network, you're absolutely setting yourself up excellently for network security monitoring. Every time you have a segment in your environment via a firewall or switch or something similar, you have an ability to quickly shut off parts of the network to contain the environment in case of a malware infection or a threat in the environment. But that pivot point, I'll call it, or collection point or uh, access control point is perfect for doing things like data collection and network security monitoring. So you have potentially a ICS aware intrusion detection system with trained human ICS defenders looking at that collected data on a regular basis. Now you may have seen network security monitoring in IT and that's awesome. And you may inside of IT see the intrusion prevention system, IPS, dropping packets where it potentially sees something malicious and that's fine. In the industrial control process, we absolutely prefer and recommend the IDS solution where it detects things and you have trained defenders looking at interpreting the uh, protocols and behavior specifically on the plant floor in the industrial control process. Now, the reason network security monitoring excels inside of the ICS is because there is generally less data, more predictable types of connections as well. So it's going to be easier to spot that needle in the haystack because it is more static. There's less users and downloads and things direct to, them, to and from the internet is typically not something you would generally see inside the ICS environment. So NSM rocks for protection for industrial control environments. Of course, with any type of security today, specifically in ICS, if you just install an IDS, it's not going to help you. You have to have those trained people with security and engineering aware backgrounds uh, to apply that knowledge as well. So technology alone will not save us not in today's uh, world anyway. And of course, the last thing we'll talk about with regards to protection, which we will run through in each of these assets, are engineering tasks. Very, very simple things we can ask and provide our engineers to perform as preventative maintenance tasks or checks when they're on site, when they're conducting the normal processing, and when they're conducting the normal work. So these simple tasks, which are the engineering tasks, can be built on to the engineering task list, which will buy you a ton of ICS defense. So a lot of good value here. And so far, the only thing that really is potentially a, a high price tag item is potentially number two, but in that situation is really you get what you pay for. You can start up network security monitoring with something as simple as Security Onion and, and maybe one or two people with engineering knowledge and security knowledge, setting that up, doing monitoring, all of those things segment by segment. So it's not a super daunting task, or you could have an organization come into your, uh, your facility and set up network security monitoring as well. So you get what you pay for, there's absolutely technology solutions out there to help with that. But again, that trained human defender is gonna be critical for that no matter what you buy. So let's go back to the Purdue model. Let's look back at network segmentation and really see how there's protection built into the Purdue model in the ICS and how we can leverage that for industrial control process um, and control system protection. Now, of course, we have the devices we talked about, those critical assets on different levels of the Purdue model, ranging right from level one, where the uh, PLCs are, the safety instrumented systems, the embedded, I'll call it, or plant floor HMI, up to level two, which is where your main HMIs will potentially be. An engineering workstation could exist at level two as well, pivoting from there higher in the environment. We're now trying to get a little bit closer to the IT environment with traditional protocols is going to be level three. Your uh, data historian, hotspot for pivoting from IT into ICS, something that I want to be very careful of. And of course, level four is where we typically get our email, et cetera. 
Now, if we go beyond this, now if we take the network security monitoring approach, we're gonna really be focusing on something called the active cyber defense cycle, which I won't go deep into, but the main component of that really is the network security monitoring piece, NSM. We talked about how it excels in ICS, and there's two ways to set that up. One is use a switch and a span configuration or mirror port off of a switch already in your industrial control environment without any additional hardware. That's one really easy way to get started with network security monitoring, especially if no additional hardware is required. It's literally configuration changes and monitoring when the process allows. Of course, on the middle part of the slide here, we have a tap embedded into the industrial control environment, similar to in the IT environment. The difference here though, is that whatever you're sniffing, the uh, TAP network traffic uh, with is gonna be, uh, should be uh, ICS specific and at least ICS aware. So it understands protocols like Modbus TCP, like Goose protocol, uh, and there's several other ones as well. So these are two different types of methodologies to approach network security monitoring. So of course, when we do network security monitoring, going back to the Purdue model, we will see those different levels we've talked about. Now we will see how network architecture and network segmentation aligns us up very, very good to have segmentation in the network, but at those segmentation or enforcement boundary points, naturally now we have a place to collect information. So if you picture those red or pink circles as an area like a firewall or switch, you can do span configuration and collect network traffic. Right now in this particular case, I can see all of the commands going to and from the HMI, which is the operator saying, hey, I need to change this in the field, right down to the PLCs that say, hey, I'm running code here. Oh, I see you wanting me to make a change. Let's make that change. And now level zero is actually impacted and something changed in the physical world. So you have visibility here, network visibility throughout the entire Purdue model, specifically focus on the industrial control system processes. Now, why am I talking so much about network security monitoring and ICS? Two reasons. It's not super, super expensive to start doing network security monitoring, especially if you have segmentation. The other one is we know, and from what we see in the adversary do, is they abuse the protocol in the environment already. So understanding what's normal in your ICS environment and what's abnormal is gonna be crucial. So looking at the network and then analyzing that network traffic to see what's odd, that's how you're gonna pivot to investigation, which likely will lead you to incident response. So I cannot speak enough about the importance of segmentation and network security monitoring, specifically to industrial control processes and protocols. See a couple more questions popping in there. Perfect, keep those coming guys. If we focus now on programmable logic controllers, specifically to the elements where we can use to protect the PLCs in the field, which could be a safety control system, uh, we can look specifically at a couple things. Now, a lot of folks have come to me and said, well, you know, I can't get data from my field devices. Well, there are ways to do that with newer versions of PLCs or even PLCs, which you can upgrade the firmware for today, if you have a PLC chassis and rack and IO uh, uh, cards, you can probably update those within the last few, few years to get the feature of syslog outputs. You can actually get event data from field devices, like super cool stuff. So take a look into that. You might have the feature available to you with just an upgrade in a specific maintenance window. Beyond the data from the PLCs, understanding when the logic was changed, critical for instant response, you can do things like use the actual keys that come with these devices, not only to quote unquote lock them, but also put them in a mode, which is a typically a quote unquote run mode to prevent remote logic changes. Now, of course, this will absolutely hamper you if you make a lot of remote access changes to your PLC environment. However, typically we don't see a lot of that. For sure it happens, it depends on your environment. In general, we have seen with the Trisys malware, for example, exactly that. Changes of the ladder logic code remotely over the network, where in some cases, not specifically the Trisys, but in some cases using that key and putting the PLC in run mode will prevent remote access to it. And yes, that means you'd have to physically go there then to change the PLC. In general, any changes to a device in the field should come with engineering approval, of course, and things, very, very simple things, as you see on screen, like checking the hash of the project file, that logic code we talked about really early on in the presentation that runs inside the PLC. If you just take a hash of those project files for your critical PLCs in your plant, site by site, 
you can very quickly determine if anything has been tampered with or changed inside the PLC. Of course, when a normal change happens, it's approved, it will change the hash as well. So having things like change management, of course, at the process level is going to be important. So the engineering team should be well in on all of this and you should be part of that from a security perspective. Also, there are things like uh, built-in software in a lot of workstations, engineering workstations, that allows you to check the hash and check the, and compare the different logic, which is what is on the production environment, but also what is potentially going to be uploaded into the environment as well. In incident response, in my perspective, in my field, when I've done it in the electric sector and recently in oil and gas, marine terminals as well, checking the project file is actually fairly simple and easy and quick to do. You see on screen here, it's literally just doing an MD5 or something similar to hash that project file. In this case here, we have uh, an ACED file and we're actually just taking that hash. So in an event of an incident, looking at the hash of the PLC code that's in production, and one that you have stored somewhere else at a band, comparing those quickly will quickly determine if your team should be focusing on instant response at the PLC level or not. Of course, if you have the same hash, then you move elsewhere. There's unlikely gonna be changes there, so you move elsewhere in your environment, speeding up the process and streamlining incident response in the industrial control sector. Beyond that, of course, the data historian, we know it's a pivot point, so things like connections to and from the data historian, in particular, anything coming into the environment in the ICS from the historian should be suspect and baseline and monitor. How do you do that? Network security monitoring, right? Also, exfiltration of information from that data historian. We talked about the pharmaceutical company that has recipes of vaccines as an example that they're using. That could be stored on the data historian as well in the charts and in the trend data. What kind of chemical was added at what rate? These things are extremely important for, uh, from an adversary perspective to get access to. Beyond that, of course, is it having a separate uh, AD environment from your IET Active Directory and no trust relationships to your ICS Active Directory if you have AD in the industrial control environment as well. So those, so those are some of the key things for protection for the data historian as we go along. Beyond that, of course, is your engineering workstation, which we have seen being targeted several times. And that is, again, looking at the network perspective to see what anomalous activity is happening. Who is logging into it? Where are they coming from? Is there data being exfiltrated off of the device? Now, this is a specific example where we have seen the uh, engineering workstation actually become a laptop, where that laptop has the programming software for the PLCs and RTUs in the field. So it's critical to get event data application data and login data to that environment. So specifically, we do see USB sticks, removable media devices being utilized to load, copy, uh, et cetera, information, ladder logic to and from the engineering workstation. So absolutely having USB connectivity logs is gonna be critical. If this device is a laptop, which makes it easy to be traveling around, it becomes a transient device risk. So things like controls on that device, so it does not get to the internet, for example, or it, it does in a controlled manner, is it fully patched? These things are now required or should be required and applied in your environment if it does leave the premises to connect to some Wi-Fi at home or Wi-Fi in a hotel, like it should not be doing that. But if it does, you have to have controls on that because it is targeted and adversaries know the uh, importance and criticality of this device and what's capable uh, for the adversaries to kind of attack. Uh, we talked about the communications and control. So this is the device that's gonna touch devices in the system at a low level in the Purdue, like those uh, intelligent electronic devices, PLCs. So looking at the network specific commands going to and from that device is gonna be critical. In here, of course, we're looking at things like services and ports coming from the engineering workstation to the service ports and uh, remote access ports of PLCs as an example. Now, of course, beyond this, we're gonna look at the HMI and protection around that. We have seen the adversary time and time again, Ukraine, for example, earlier this year as well, gravitating toward the HMI. Remote access to your human machine interface is critical. How do you do that today? Does your operators use multi-factor authentication? Do they use something like TeamViewer? Do they use RDP as an example? Baselining that and making sure it's a safe, secure, multi-factor layered approach is gonna be critical. Many, many, many times I do see pivoting from remote access into the HMI via a jump box, which does give you the ability to do additional monitoring. So that could be a solution. And that jump box starts out in uh, the DMZ, which allows you to kind of pivot and control access into the environment. Uh, 
Now, again, the communications, what does the HMI do? You're looking at the network specific traffic coming from the HMI because that HMI is going to tell the PLCs to change something in the field or read something in the field. Also, changes on the HMI, like we've seen with the Oldsmar attack, or that uh, that uh, chemical was changed, application logs or alarm logs from the HMI application, also going to be critical to do monitoring, and that will help you protect the HMI as you go along. Now, no surprise here, anybody on the call is really coming from that IT environment, really going to be focusing on things like sandboxing for the IT email system, URLs and attachments, and, and that's nothing new here. What I do suggest, though, if you have an organization which has an IT department that supports the reliability and safety of operations, supporting and helping the ICS security teams, it's really having the security team in IT understand what the processes are, what's happening in the ICS, so they can actually give a quote-unquote heads up to the folks inside the ICS security team. Because stage one, early stages of an attack for an ICS attack can start in IT. And if you give the heads up, do containment in IT, ICS is then aware and ready as well as the adversary tries to pivot through the environment. So we've covered a lot of content here. Let's kind of layer one more big thing on your plate here. Do you have an asset inventory? Now, we haven't really discussed an asset inventory, but we all know it's critical to have that. How can you protect what you don't know you have? So getting things like an asset inventory is, is going to be a main prerequisite, I will call it, for this. And so we'll build that into the couple slides we have in a minute, which really goes through, here's your axioms for today based on today's conversation. So we'll take a look at what little Bobby says here. Do you have an asset inventory? Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're here to do an assessment and we want to find all of your critical ICS assets. Yes, here you go. We have an asset inventory for you. And typically I see a lot of engineering firms and, and, and organizations have really solid documentation. And that's great, but as we know, documentation can get old over time and not be updated. But beyond just the here's what we have written down, it's really important literally to have these discussions as we see the lobby here on the plant floor. Discussions with engineers, safety folks as well to say, you know, what's critical here? We know HMI is critical, the PLC racks are critical, the engineering workstations, but in your specific ICS environment, if something were to happen to a critical physical asset, what would that impact be on the actual process to the monetization of the organization, et cetera? So, yeah, here is your, your ICS uh, asset identification and inventory. But the question becomes, what would make you have a bad day if it goes down? Of course, what we see here in this case, there's a turbine here. And if that actually has an issue, like start running, there's potential safety concerns. So that's also a critical asset. Earlier today, we talked a little bit about passive devices and also um, active devices, which could be a safety system, engineering devices. We may not have an interface and protocol attached to it. Could be critical for your ICS as well. So understand how that is isolated from the environment and protect that as well. So if that wasn't enough for you, where do you start? Where does this conversation go? Those five critical assets we talked about, we know are targeted, we're tracking adversaries, continually look at those devices to take advantage of them, which directly disrupt and interact with, in a negative way, the industrial control environment. So where do we start from an ICS defense perspective? Well, not to worry, ICS defense is totally doable. We have a couple different resources and ways for you to approach this. Of course, network security monitoring and network segmentation are the most effective and affordable ways to start doing ICS defense in general, specifically to protect these kinds of assets we've been talking about. So here is the suggested action plan from today's content to really kickstart your ICS defense program. So within the first one to seven days, my suggestion is take the next week, review these slides, review this webcast recording, document what is a applicable to you. Take those five assets, understand where are they? What happens if they go down as an example? Of course, you're going to be focusing on the critical sites that you prioritize first. These are going to be highly connected sites, potentially remote access sites, but also sites that are IP connected. So I would not worry so much about hardwired devices, but really the IP connected automated systems uh, and, and modernized systems for sure. So focus on those for the next, my suggestion is, is, is within the next week or 30 days. Beyond that, you have then a good list to kind of approach network security monitoring and things like segmentation with your key sites. Taking the next month or two months to really connect with your teams. This is where little Bobby goes into the environment and says, hey, 
you know, what's important in your environment here. Having those discussions on the plant floor, I cannot say enough about how positive it is for those kinds of uh, relationships to be built in that way. Uh, safety and engineering and, and other key stakeholders should be part of that uh, discussion. Connecting with physical safety teams on site, the engineering folks, operators using the HMIs, all of those folks are going to be critical for those uh, 60, uh, 30 to 60 days. Beyond that, really start understanding from those conversations. Well, now you have an understanding of what the critical assets are. Start inventorying them as well. And don't worry, it sounds daunting. We have freely available resources in the next two slides to help with that. So within the next three months, you have a clear understanding of what assets that you have. You have a great relationship built with your safety engineering folks as well. They now know security is there to support the safety and reliability of operations. And then my suggestion is you have 90 to 120 days to start visiting sites when it's safe to do so. Physically visiting sites for walkthroughs, understanding what assets are on the plant floor, where the HMI is, where the PLCs are, how do they interact, et cetera and they really prioritize the top three sites, starting network security monitoring and or network segmentation, whatever suits you first. So these newly released guides can help you. So I know this is a lot of content to, uh, to kind of get in your head today on a Friday. So let's pivot to those, these two uh, great resources to help you. And we've just released these fairly recently, and this resource is number one. This is the ICS Site Visit Plan. This will prepare you to get to site in a safe way. It'll tell you what the assets are that we've just talked about, which are potentially very critical for your environment, how to look at those assets, how to build relationships on the, uh, with folks at the plant, also how to hack your physical environment before you get to site, understand from an OSINT perspective what the adversary already knows about the industrial control environment, and so on. So I highly recommend taking a route through this. Uh, it's two sides. It's the ICS site visit plan. Beyond that, no surprise here, the ICS Network Security Monitoring specific cheat sheet, what NSM is, how it's applied to the industrial control environment, but also different ways to understand what protocols are on the network, how you're going to go about setting up a span port, or maybe a tap would be better for you. Uh, if you're looking at it from a budgetary perspective and you have no funding at this point, then maybe a span port configuration will be the best. So it gives examples of how to set that up and phase it in in a safe way as well. Also goes ahead and talks about detection analysis and also uh, the, uh, yeah, sorry, your collection detection and the analysis components of the network security monitoring, and also how to start pivoting into industrial control system incident response as well. And if that wasn't enough, then if you are on this call and you are in the position that are managing industrial control systems or you're a practitioner moving up to a management level to set up and start industrial control system um, uh, management kind of uh, programs, or you're in place today, an existing manager that has ICS security practitioners reporting to them, this new course, which is the ICS 418, ICS Security Essentials for Managers is currently in development. This is coming to a conference and or online uh, as soon as we can make it available and awesome. So that is uh, definitely in, in development now. So please keep a lookout for ICS 418 as we go along. With that, we have eight minutes left. So I do want to open up the floor, open up the chat window for any questions that you guys may have. So my contact information is here. Again, my name is Dean Parsons. Super pumped to have you guys uh, here today. I'm a certified and SANS instructor for ICS 515, Active Incident Response, and I'm co-authoring that ICS 4, uh, 418 course I just mentioned as well. So with that, there is some time for questions. and I'll pass it over to Carol just to see if she has any questions to read out from the chat window that we have there. So Carol, over to you. All right, thanks, Dean. We do have quite a few questions ready, so I'll just jump in and get started. Uh, the sure. first one asks, have you seen any threat actors targeting wind turbine controllers and the buoys? Oh, yeah. So it's a great question. Um, so wind turbine controllers and the buoys. So this is really the oil and gas sector or the wind uh, generation uh, system. Um, there is absolutely, um, I'll say, academic uh, targeted attacks kind of um, that have been walked through and are absolutely available and, and um, possible. I have not seen targeted attacks on those environments specifically. However, the devices inside of an nacelle, for example, or inside a buoy are very similar to the PLCs, the HMIs, the firewalls we talked about in the other sectors. So my point is, while we haven't yet seen a targeted attack on a wind farm, 
a lot of the tactic techniques and procedures we've seen in other sectors can apply with just minor adjustments to those sectors and those specific devices? That's a great question. All right, thanks. Uh, what OS do engineer workstations run typically? Yeah, excellent question as well. Engineering workstations can run a version of Linux or a version of Windows. Uh, so in the cases of Windows, for example, or Linux, what's important from an, a protection perspective is to get access to the application and security logs from the Windows environment, but also the USB insertions as well. From a Linux perspective, similar kind of thing applies. Now, if you're looking at these engineering workstations from an, um, an instant response perspective, there's software out there that we use to baseline these devices, Windows or, or Linux, and it baselines the memory of the devices, what's running in memory, and every now and then we go back to relook at the memory and do another capture of the memory and then compare uh, every couple months. What that'll do, it'll not only look at the uh, Windows application logs, but the memory of what was run, what is running in the environment, et cetera. Beyond that, uh, having like a seam, which is an OT seam, to get those logs off the engineering workstation is really the ultimate kind of goal. It's a great question. So to clarify, uh, Windows and Linux systems. All right, thanks. Uh, can you recommend any labs or VMs that simulate ICS environments that can be used to practice on and gain familiarity? Yeah, great question. So I'm totally biased here because I teach ICS 515. So we actually do a lot of that in class. Um, there are, uh, so does 410 as well, so ICS 410 and, and ICS 612. But with regards to tools that are freely available, you can download now the, uh, and I'll, I'll try to drop it in the uh, uh, channel here as well, is the uh, controlthings.io. So if you uh, navigate to controlthings.io, that's actually a penetration testing platform, a Linux-based platform that has a lot of packet analysis pre-built in for you to use with the tools it has as well to perform analysis on traffic uh, that's come from an industrial control environment. So I'm not saying take these tools and run it on your ICS. That's not what I'm saying. But that tool is available for you uh, to, to look at these kinds of packets and uh, start doing some analysis. Hopefully that answers your question. Controlthings.io, great question. All right, thanks. Uh, let's see here. What's the difference between an engineering workstation and an HMI in the supervisory level? At that level, yeah. the HMI would be on the uh, engineering workstation. Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll clarify there. In our diagram, we talked about a human machine interface at a lower level in the Purdue, and we talked about a human machine interface at a higher level uh, as well. So the engineering workstation uh, is going to be that programming system. Now the HMIs specifically can be, and the operator workstation, for example, at level two or three, can be that primary HMI. So that's really where you have operators sitting in a in a control room, uh, using the operations uh, HMI to control or read the process. The other HMI, which is the lower version of the HMI, is not necessarily that Windows or Linux device. It could absolutely be an embedded system on a touch panel, literally in the plant, on the plant floor. So the higher level HMI, picture somebody sitting in an office, maybe drinking coffee, not checking their email because they have no access to the IT environment in that case. Uh, and it's a nice, comfortable environment, right? And the I, in the HMI at the lower level of Purdue, it's that embedded system where you're probably on the plant floor with, in a hard hat and like boots and safety goggles. Uh, interacting with a touchscreen that directly controls the process at that level. And that's a great question. I want to bring up the point that in environments where the main HMI, the operator's workstation, main HMIs are taken down or compromised, then they can sometimes be taken offline completely in certain circumstances, and the process can still run in and in 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 maintain safety in the plant by those embedded HMIs at the lower level. Great, great question. All right, thanks. Uh... Why should we back up ICS OT devices or data? Could you repeat that question? Sure. They said, how should we back up ICS slash OT devices or data? Yeah, excellent question. So the primary thing you want to back up in the OT space are things like the ladder logic or project files from the PLCs, uh, control settings and things of that nature. I have seen a lot of that stored inside the ICS environment on uh, a, a network shared drive as an example or something similar, but some kind of, um, I'll say, um, 
good grade of, of a backup system is, is user required. Now, the obvious question here is, well, can we just do it on the IT and because we have a NAS over there, et cetera? My suggestion is not to have the same device backup, the IT and the ICS environment. But for sure, you should have a professional grade backup tool. I have seen in some cases people starting off with just taking Logic files and literally putting it on a shared, uh, on a, a solid state drive and a car or two of them and literally storing them in a safe on site and off site as well in a backup control center. Uh, so that's 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 the approach that I would take. Uh, the most important thing from a security perspective is to make sure whatever solution you have is separated from the IT environment. It's a great question. All right, well, with that, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dean, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.